Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to There's No Business Like. I'm Brian Zelmer from Kutztown University in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And I'm here, as always, with my friends, Josh. Hey, it's Josh Benson here in Marion, Illinois at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Katie. Hello, Katie Miller coming to you from Midland, Michigan and the Midland Center for the Arts. Danielle. Hey, it's Danielle Van Hook, a love and life from the Alden in McLean, Virginia. And Mr. Curly Mustache himself, Kevin. Hello, Kevin Maynard from Quad City Arts, but in the border of Iowa and Illinois. Is there a name for that type of mustache? Handlebar. Handle Mr. Handlebar Mustache. Good to know. Have any of you guys played an instrument when you were a kid or sang in a chorus or in your church or anything like that? And how did you choose? In junior high, I picked up the trumpet and uh, I played trumpet through my sophomore year of high school. Um, but I really wanted to be a drummer. And then I've thought about picking up the trumpet again, but now I don't have the fingers for it. <laughs> what happened with the drums? Why didn't that happen if that's what you wanted to do? I don't think my parents wanted to hear me practice drums. I think that's what it really came down to. Ah. <laughs> 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 Interesting you should say that. So, Brian, I was a singer, so I sang in church choir and school choir uh, growing up. But when we moved from Massachusetts to Michigan, uh, in Massachusetts, you start an instrument in fifth grade. No, in sixth grade, excuse me. And then in, Ma in Michigan, you start an instrument in fifth grade. So when we moved at the end of my fifth grade year, I completely missed the opportunity in switching oh, no. schools and states to learn an instrument. Um, my brother did not. He was a clarinetist, but I've always been slightly jealous of everyone that got to try out an instrument in both states. Katie, that's horrible. I know. <laughs> why, didn't, why didn't the school let you catch up? That's not, that's not right. We're going to use my time machine and go back and fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, as a singer and then, and of course I was a dancer too. So I had, I had a life still full of art, even though I did not play an instrument. Well, that's good. I desperately wanted to be an instrumentalist in elementary school. We were allowed to try out three and it was like in like a 10 minute period. And I was certain that my instrument was going to be the flute and it felt so unnatural. And I like panicked a little bit. I talked him into letting me try four instruments. Um, and I ultimately chose the clarinet and I tried moderately hard to learn how to play the clarinet <laughs> and it didn't go great. Uh, me and the clarinet just like we didn't have synergy. In high school, I found myself in the drum line and cymbals was the most uh, success I got in the music field. I played the oboe for like a hot minute. <laughs> And it was the school like brought in a bunch of instruments and you could try out to see which ones are like uh, what type of instrument you were good at playing. And to be honest, I was much better at playing like the trumpet and, you know, sort of brass instruments like that. But I chose the oboe because one, I could make the noise out of the reed. Um, and my friend Matt played the oboe. So I was like, oh, cool. Just hang out with Matt. Turns out I still like Matt, but I hated playing the oboe. So <laughs> <laughs> at least the friendship outlasted the instrument. Yeah, yeah. So then I, you know, I just continued to sing in like school choir and stuff like that while I was in school. That's funny. My school didn't offer uh, an instrument, but in third grade, I had taken a liking to listening to the violin so much that I was pretending I was playing air violin everywhere. And my nana saw that and wanted to encourage that and paid for lessons as a fourth or fifth grader, I was taking it at a college level and, and really, but the problem was I was, it was always on Saturdays. I would spend my days on Saturdays doing the violin at uh, SUNY New Paltz and all my friends were playing and I was missing out on that. So I chose after a long, hard fight with my parents. I gave up the violin, which I regret to this day. I, I ask that question because Marion Leibowitz became a professional musician. The instrument that she ended up playing was sort of like what you said, Josh. Her parents didn't like her first couple choices. So take a listen to this interview and we'll see you on the other side. Hi, I'm Marion Leibowitz, and I'm the owner of Marion Leibowitz Artist Management, based in Morro Bay, California. Hi, Marion, and welcome to the podcast. Brian, it's great to be here with you. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about what uh, Marion Leibowitz Artist Management is? It's a boutique booking agency that focuses on a curated roster of both small ensembles as well as some larger shows my artists are, for the most part, based in Southern California. 
and focus on the genres of world music, jazz, crossover, and a little bit of classical. That's terrific. And I want to dive more into the business of being an agent. But first, I want to just go back and learn a little bit about your professional journey. I know you've had um, some different paths in your career from being a professional artist yourself, as well as uh, a professor. If you could maybe just give us a little bit about um, where you started and how you got to where you are today. Well, I was fortunate enough to go to the Eastman School of Music for my Bachelor of Music and Clarinet Performance. I followed that with a master's degree in musicology from Smith College, and then completed my training at USC uh, with a doctorate in clarinet. And from there, I got a job at San Diego State University being a full-time tenured professor of music. And so I spent the bulk of my career in this dual role of being a professor as well as a clarinet performer. So how did you balance that? Because um, I'm assuming being the professional performer, you had to go on the road or, uh, you know, go away from where the college is based. When you get a collegiate teaching position, you are expected to do what they call professional growth. In the early years, I was doing a lot of performing with symphonies and with uh, small ensembles. I had a very successful wind quintet. And then I won a competition, and it was a real game changer for me, Brian. I won a competition sponsored by the Kennedy Center and the U.S. uh, State Department. And the competition sent me with a pianist to six countries in Central America. And if you think that there's nothing life-changing about going to Central America with your clarinet, let me tell you, it was huge. First of all, it opened up my eyes to a more global perspective of what my role in the arts could be. And second of all, it showed me that in those countries, women don't typically have those roles. And the little girls would look at us and we were in our beautiful gowns and we had our fancy shoes. And they just thought this was incredible that women could be coming uh, from abroad and perform on a national stage for them. And it made me realize that it wasn't just about the music, it was about role modeling. And I can tell you that that changed the way I taught in the classroom. And it's definitely formed the basis for how I run my agency today and the choices I make in curating who's on my roster. That's an amazing story, and and it's great to hear that you're an inspiration to so many young women in uh, Central and South America. You mentioned that you were able to take some of what you learned then and bring that back to the classroom. Can you just talk a little bit more about that and go a little deeper into that? Yes, of course. So when I went to Eastman, the career track that we were exposed to was you could either be a member of an orchestra. And frankly, if you were second clarinet, that was not acceptable. You had to be the principal clarinet. (laughs) Or you could teach in the public schools. Those were sort of your two options back then. And when I got my job as a professor, I thought, that's just not expansive enough. First of all, there's not going to be enough spots for everybody if that's all we look at. And second of all, there's so much more to do that's interesting in the field. So I started getting interested in how do we teach performers how to make a living? What's the whole entrepreneurship side of the industry? And this is long before universities were talking about entrepreneurship programs. And so I created coursework in the early 90s to start talking about how do we make a living as performers? And then that developed to how do we make a living by going to audiences that can't come out to venues that we normally might go to ourselves? And so I started teaching a course called Community Outreach Practicum, and we went into jails, we went into veterans rehab settings, we went into hospitals, and of course schools. And I thought, this is my worldview. I want my performers, whoever I'm working with, and myself at the time, to be able to go to anybody and bring art. So it really did change the way I taught. And I I would say I was a bit of a curricular innovator because I had to keep inventing courses to teach what I wanted to teach. There wasn't anything standardized in the curriculum yet. So that's how it worked out. And then eventually SDSU, where I was teaching, was able to start a music entrepreneurship major. And it 
was in part because I had been teaching these classes. So there was things in the curriculum that already lent themselves to teaching performers and frankly, administrators and other people in the industry how to make money. If a student is listening to this and they think they want to become an educator, either in the public schools or even a professor like you were, uh, what advice would you have for them? Well, first of all, I think any student listening to this needs to think about what puts fire in their belly? What makes them excited about this industry? And whether you're in music or in dance or any art form, what art form really makes you feel joy? And are you somebody who wants to be making the art or teaching the art or creating an environment where the art can be brought to others? And so there's a number of career tracks available to a young person today in the arts, many more than when I was in school for sure. And if you wanna be a teacher, the two choices as you enumerated are to be a public school teacher or someone who teaches basically K through 12, even if it's private school or to be a university or collegiate professor. So those are two very different career tracks, even though they would seem to be similar. Because as a K through 12 educator, you have to be uh, getting a music education degree. So that's one, one path. The other path of being a university professor typically involves getting the terminal degree in your field. And for most of us, that means getting either the DMA, the doctorate in musical arts, or the PhD. I want to back up even further and find out what it was that inspired you to, to become a clarinetist. Is that, am I saying that? It correct? is a clarinetist. And I was a product of the uh, Huntington, New York school system that gave every child an instrument in the fourth grade. And honestly, it was complete serendipity that got me the clarinet because I had no idea what I wanted to play. And my mother kept telling me to go in and, well, see if they have a guitar. I like the guitar. And of course, they didn't teach guitar. So I came back and said, they don't have that. How about the flute? And she said, no, that's too high. That's going to irritate my ears. And I said, all right. She said, how about going back and seeing if they have a violin like your father played? And I said, well, you know, daddy played it, but it was really hard. And that's the whole string process. So anyway, this went on for a couple of weeks until finally all they had left was the clarinet and that was given to me and fortunately I took to it and and did well with it. How did it go from okay well this is all that's left to wow I want to pursue a career in this? I just kept pursuing it and I was a good student in all my subjects but something about music just kept lighting me up and I had good people that were uh you know, telling me where to get education. I was taking the train in the Long Island Railroad into Manhattan every week to get a clarinet lesson with the great Leon Rushanoff. And my parents never went to college or had music background of that level to know to send me there. That was a teacher who said, you know what, you've exceeded my capacity as a teacher. I want you to go study with the great Leon Rushanoff. And I think that that passion for the career is something that we all need if we're gonna stick in this career. And my passion for music has never changed, whether I've been a teacher, a performer, or now an agent representing other performers, the passion is consistent. And that's the thing I wanna say to young people is, you do this cause you'll love it. And you really, it, it just lights you up every single day. If you see someone with a spark, and there's someone else you know who could help that spark grow. I think it behooves us to, to move people along and connect them to the right people. Uh, that's part of our legacy to the young people coming into the field today. Absolutely. Now, you are a clarinetist and a tenured professor for 35 years. I want to know how you went from that to being an agency owner. Well, I told you my interest in helping performance majors was there from the start. I saw that there was a gap in the way we were teaching students back then, um, and perhaps now as well, although I think that there are more and more campuses realizing that you need to teach performers how to make a living. 
But I thought I need to take this one step further. I need to get work for these people. I need to have gigs, if you will, for the students to perform so they learn what it means to play professionally. I started um, with a grant. I won a grant to do this, to pay the students to go into various community locations and practice their craft. And that was the first inkling that I you know, would do this for others. I was already booking my wind quintet at that time, and we were going to WA, uh, the Western Arts Alliance, to represent ourselves. We'd had an agent, but after a couple of years, she said, you know, I don't really want to represent anybody anymore, and you guys go on your own. So I was going to Western Arts Alliance 30 years ago, long before I had my own roster. So I started helping students, and then that branched out and I was helping alumni and I was helping faculty. And all of a sudden I'm booking 400 events a year under the auspices of the university. And so I thought, well, you know, this is getting to be a lot to do for fun. Um, there's a lot going on here. And it's, you know, so I had to try to get myself funded to do what I was doing. And what I noticed, and this is what's important to tell young people, I noticed that I love doing this more than anything else I was doing. I mean, I was so excited when I'd see a booking come in. I was like, oh my God, this is great. I've got this person going there. I just loved it. And I loved forming the relationships with the buyers and saying, okay, well, if you're taking this, um, this young brass quintet this month, would you like to try a string group next month? And I, I found that I had a natural interest in building those relationships with buyers. And so... After several years of doing this and growing this under the campus umbrella, I realized it was time to start it on the outside of the campus because there were other people approaching me who were not part of that campus family saying, we need this help and you're good at it and we want you to help us get work. And that was when I realized I had to start my own business. And being an entrepreneur, I started it in 2013 and we're going to celebrate 10 years of Marion Leibowitz Artist Management next season. And of course, one thing led to another because that seems to be what happens with the way I work. And now, you know, I've got a seven figure business. How did you get your first clients, your actual first true client? Well, they were people who knew what I was doing at SDSU and maybe one or two of them had performed with a group from the school and they said, well, I have another band. I would like you to do something for us. And I'd take a look and I'm like, there's no one in there who's part of the SDSU family. And that's when I realized I've got to do something on my own. And so I started off that way. And then, well, you know how it is. One thing leads to another and people hear about you and, oh, we were just at this festival. There's another artist there I think you should really check out. And then that person came on and then, well, I have another group that does this. And one thing led to another. And what's so great about this relationship between agent and artist is when you're part of their artistic process and you've got them years ahead planning where they're headed so that they can monetize their work properly while growing their art. I mean, I get so excited by this. If you're a young artist out there and you think you want to be represented by an agent such as yourself, what are the, because I'm sure you get a lot of people that approach you that aren't just a good fit, so you have to turn them down. What are the things that artists should or could do to really woo an agent and, and satisfy that relationship? That's really an interesting question because recently I was approached by an artist and as we were going along the process of getting to know one another, we discovered certain things that made it not a good fit at this time. And he was able to place himself with another agent who was a better fit for him right now. And so I really thought about this subject you brought up. I know for me, I get a lot of inquiries and I always at least open the message, read it. And if it's in any way coherent, I will look at the music or the dance or whatever it is and at least respond because I know what it is to be an artist reaching out and feeling like no one's paying attention. So I don't ignore inquiries unless what comes to me is, hey, check this out, and it's a link. I never, I mean, if you don't have the time to woo me, I'm not going to pay attention to your inquiry. And so young people need to be careful that they're not overly casual, especially with people 
of my generation. I mean, I make it sound like I'm ancient, but I'm not. It's just good relationship skills to really introduce your work to somebody. But before that, you want to really review what makes that agent tick? What is it that they are passionate about? And do I do what could make them passionate? And do would I bring something to the table for them? And that's one of the things I talk to at this point in my agency. I'm not taking on somebody new who isn't bringing something to the table. And by bringing something to the table, I mean, they have to be prepared to say, we've already got relationships with these venues and we're going to give you the ability to network with those venues in our behalf because we know you've got other artists that also need to be connected to those venues. And likewise, you're going to take us and connect us to the venues you've already made relationships with so we can work. So it has to be this real symbiotic relationship that the artist is a good fit artistically with who I represent, I have to absolutely love their work. I mean, their work has to send me to the moon because don't forget, I'm pitching it all day long every day and I'm listening to it. And if I'm jazzed about it, then I'm going to be able to make someone else excited about it too. You said that you need to be jazzed by it, which it doesn't mean that they're not good. It, like some, An artist can come to you and be really, really good, but if it's not something that you're into or can get into, it's not a good fit. But do you have then uh, a network of other agents or, or people that you might be able to recommend them to? And vice versa, do other agents say, hey, you know, I think you'd be really great with Marion. I do get people forwarding people to me from time to time. Um, I belong to N NAPAMA, the National Association of Performing Arts Managers and Agents. And so we do get to know one another pretty well. And uh, sometimes there'll be agents whose work I really admire, but they promote commercial acts. Now, I have promoted some of my groups in commercial settings, but for the most part, I have that curated roster that is going to be pursued by performing arts centers, nonprofit festivals, this sort of thing. And so we do have an awareness of what one another does. What other work does an agent do other than those connections you're talking about that artists bring with, with certain venues? How do you go about trying to get work at venues maybe that you don't have those connections to start with? You know, that's such a great question, Brian, because as you well know, we've been through a couple of years of pandemic and it really changed the way we did business. And during the pandemic, with the inability to go to conferences live, I got went to everything I could virtually. I really saturated myself because I realized I was going to be meeting people that I normally wouldn't meet. And I did bring in a lot of new clients that way. Uh, and now that conferences are starting back up live, uh, I'm having to review my protocols. I've typically gone to three conferences per year live. I almost always go to Western Arts Alliance. I almost always go to APAP. And then of late, I've also added Arts Northwest. Last year, I went to NCPC Arts Market in Raleigh, North Carolina, and that will be a keeper when it comes back. It, it, it's Right now, it's skipping a year. I've had to look at what can I physically do? I'm a solo shop. You know, I do have uh, assistance with my marketing and this sort of thing, but it's very part-time. I'm the solo booking agent and all the relationships are with me. And I have to weigh a couple of things. Am I physically able to get to the conference? Because some of them are really off the beaten path. They're in towns that are very hard to get to from Morro Bay. And then some of them just don't seem like a good use of the dollars. So that's one of the things I've been really thinking about. And how, as you pointed out, can I make new connections that are people not necessarily going to those conferences? Because not every presenting organization goes to conferences. And so I do reach out and I do pay attention and Sometimes I'm getting out of the blue contacts. Those are the ones we love. They said, you know, I see that you're bringing a group to Casper, Wyoming. We have a series in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and we'd like to work with you. So 
when once I've got an artist in one location, the idea is to fan out and see who else in their territory is also, um, you know, uh, presenting and might want to jump on the fact that the artist is already coming through. There's also something called consortiums. Some of them are state consortiums. Some are like the League of Historic Theaters. They're based on a certain theme. Um, I know that you're involved in some. I'm, I've seen you on Pennsylvania Presenters, and a lot of those have meetings. And, and since the pandemic, a lot of the meetings have been through Zoom and other things where you can be anywhere and meet with these people. Has that helped the game in any way from the agency side? Well, some more than others. Um, I, I, As you know, I've been to Pennsylvania Presenters meetings. I've been to Tennessee Presenters meetings. Uh, and I've done a lot of the Zoom meetings that have been conference related with the larger networks. And what I look at as an agent is, have I gotten any bookings from making those efforts? Has anybody actually been connected with me and purchased a show? And so I look at that stuff because again, I only have so many hours in the day. And also is the organization presenting opportunities where I actually get to talk to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, or is it all sort of, I'm sitting here with my back against my chair, listening to a lot of people talking about a topic that may or may not be much of interest to me, but I don't get to even chime in. Um, and so I look at what is going to be the nature of my interaction. I'll give you an example. APAP recently started doing these um, Oh, speed dating online. And you, you get on and you get paired with different presenters over a period of an hour. And at first I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be difficult. But fortunately, I'm not a shy wallflower. So I am able to speak to people. And I got several bookings out of just meeting with presenters one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two in a Zoom setting of speed dating. And for me, that really helped because these are people I wouldn't have met otherwise, because they too might be from a remote community where they can be on a Zoom meeting, but going to a conference is outside their budget or their wherewithal. So I want to go back to your first conference. You said you went to conferences years ago as an artist, but I, I want to go to the first conference you went to as an agent. And I'm sure it was a completely different kind of experience than when you went as an artist. How long did it take you to kind of get in a groove and, and figure things out? When I started going to WA in the 80s, okay, so that's dating me, I was a, I was being represented by an agent and I was learning at her side. And then when she said, I don't want to be an agent anymore, I became a self-represented artist for my wind quintet and we would go to WA and people would say, oh, don't expect much the first year. You're not going to get anything. But we got work. And then as I kept going and then became an agent representing student and faculty performers and my own career, I made more connections. And then finally, like you say, when I branched out and I had Marion Leibowitz Artist Management, I had to sort of rebrand because people had known me as someone who was representing students, which was no longer the case. And people would still go, well, she only represents students. No, no, no. I have a different roster now. So I would say that I had an easier entree at that point because I had all those years of getting to know people and experience just knowing what to expect. Yes, every year is better. And I keep coming back, growing our fan base and our number of clients. And what's also happened is I listen to the feedback. I also want to say I have a very close relationship with my artists. We meet as a roster regularly. And I don't know if other agents do that. Um, each group on my roster has a group leader and that person and sometimes others from the group join in the Zoom roster meeting. And we get together to talk about certain topics. And maybe in my own way, I'm still a teacher at heart because I'm saying, okay, here's where we're going. I'm going to conference in a couple of weeks. I need to know what shows are really exciting for you. Now, what do you want to play? What's going to make you tick in the next two seasons? And do you have a writer for that show? And do you have, and we talk, and what are we going to do about this little issue about travel? My goodness, travel's become difficult. And you, you're 
you know, your flights are getting changed and canceled. What are we going to do if that happens for your next booking? And so it's become this exciting forum where we talk about issues as a collective. And I call us a family and they, they call us a family too. And I love it that the artists think that way about one another. Our time is almost up, but I want to let you in on a secret. Uh, I actually own a time machine and I want to bring you in it. And we're going to go back and see Marion, who's not quite figured out that she's going to play clarinet yet. And you have a moment or two to give her some, some advice for her future. What, what do you tell her? You don't have to worry about anything. Just do each day what makes you happy and do it with passion. And if you do that each day, you will know exactly what to do. I love that. Um, is there any other wisdom that you'd like to pass on to the student that might be sitting and listening to this that heard what you said about being an agent, but they they aren't quite sure what they should do next. Well, I'll make a little confession to you. Even at this age where I've retired from a career as a performer and I've retired from a career as a professor, I have a career coach. And I would say to students today, many of you justify spending money on a private teacher for your instrument, but how many of you are willing to spend money to get a career coach? Because that person could really cut through a lot of the blocks you have in yourself that are keeping you from finding exactly what's going to light your fire. I always ask this as the last question. What do you like most about working in the industry today? I like the ever-changing platform of colleagues. I love the relationships I have in the industry. And you and I both know a lot of people are moving around. There's been a tremendous shift because either venues fell apart and new ones opened or people left the field and someone got a job. And I just love hearing about that. I want to know what's going on everywhere. I love that the industry, through the vehicle of art, is servicing this larger community of the world. It, it makes me excited every single day. And to find those resources to make it happen. Well, thank you for joining us today, Mary, and it's been a great pleasure listening to everything you had to say. Thank you, Brian. Take good care. I loved a lot of what she had to say, but I, I really enjoy that she found what brought her joy, even though she was already in the arts and she was already an accomplished musician and a concert musician, and she loved what she did there. She then recognize that within the arts world, there was something that still brought her more joy than that, that she wanted to pursue. Right. And she talked a lot about following your bliss and how if you do the thing that you love the most, that is going to make for a long and fulfilling career. And I do admire that a lot about Marion's career, that she found something good in each stage. So being a professional musician, then transitioning into academia and really finding a way to support students and faculty by getting them gigs and recognizing that they needed professional experience before students would graduate and crafting new curriculum for them and kind of being a pioneer in the business, teaching the business side of the industry in academic setting. And then, like you said, finding, recognizing that like, oh, oh, I really love this booking agent side of things and then making another shift. I think it's a great evolution, an example of how to evolve over the course of your career and, and following that bliss. Yeah, and sort of taking that back to where, you know, a focus on arts education and the importance of having that experience as, as a kid to sort of like spark that passion and ignite that um, to, you know, take her on that journey as well as, you know, give that opportunity to other people on that journey as well. That's one thing that I really loved that, that she talked about was that, she saw a void within the music department that she was teaching within. They they were teaching the, the musicians the craft, but they weren't teaching them the business at all. So that they had an idea of what the business was like and how to function as a professional musician, how to take that art and make it a living. And, and I think that's a really important thing to acknowledge within academia is that so often within arts programs, they're so dedicated to pushing towards the art itself and the art form itself that they forget that if people are going to move forward in this, that, that it is a business. And so I, I celebrate those programs that, that focus on that and that bring that into the equation. Yeah, that's, that's incredibly important. And I know my background and my education background is purely business. And I have a lot of friends who went into the arts, became, you know, musicians, actors, et cetera. And within their first year out, I got a lot of phone calls and people reaching out of like, 
how do I do this? How do I do my taxes? How do I, you know, market myself as a business? Because I've spent the last four years focusing on my craft and not realizing that it's also about marketing yourself. And it's also, you know, what do you do once that money starts coming in? She said at one point, um, you know, I was getting like 200 bookings a year and I thought this is getting to be a lot to do for fun. <laughs> I loved how she also uh, realized that she was a role model when she went to perform in, in Central America. And now you look at her roster and she's got several people. She's bringing them up. They're, they're young women that are performers, professional performers now from that region that are on her roster. And she's you know helping them make a living. Talking about you know, her professional roster now, I love that transition point for her where she had been known for being the person that was representing these students. And then whenever she launched with her own roster of professional musicians, she had to then essentially fully rebrand herself and remarket herself and re-network herself throughout the conferences as someone that has professional musicians, not just students anymore. And I think my big takeaway, Josh, from that is to not be afraid of transition and to not be afraid of trying something new. I think it can be really intimidating to have an idea and to actually take the leap. And Marion's story just demonstrates to all of us, whether you are new to the industry, whether you're a midfield or a mid-career person, or you've been in for a while, that it is okay to take that leap, to take a chance, um, to rebrand yourself, whatever that is. Uh, it's, it's just a great example of, of how that could work. And if you're smart about it, then the sky is the limit. When I think too, we don't talk a lot about how agents um, curate their roster. Um, and she had a lot of great things to say about if you are um, an artist looking for representation. She talked about listening to her artist's uh, music while she's working. It's just it's so cyclical how that passion is happening. She's talking about them all day um, and their music and what they do. And, and you'd think that you'd get tired of it. But no, she, you know, I mean, she loves them so much. And I bet she hears different things in their music the 800th time, you know, that she's listened to a track. I've never actually worked with Marion and I didn't even know her before the pandemic. I met her through all the, the many Zooms that occurred during the pandemic where we started to get to meet a lot more colleagues, a lot of new people, which actually I think that's how Katie and I met also. I just want to thank Marion for taking the time to uh, speak with us and share her experience. And, and uh, it was really special and, and getting to know her. And like all of these conversations, I hope you guys are getting something out of it too. And we'll talk to you soon. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Life. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Van Hoek. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? <laughs> I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslike.com. Do I sound out bus i -ness every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. Yeah, That's one and also... Thing. And, and also, you know, <laughs> one, two, three, go. Uh, and and also, thing. I think it's worth pointing out. That 